Tony Urbano was a puppeteer who was trained by and worked with master puppeteers such as Ralph Chesse and Bill and Cora Baird. Tony turned down a job offer from Jim Henson to focus on building his own career, a career that included hundreds of commercials and television and film work, including Flight of the Navigator, Short Circuit, Men in Black, Team America, and many, many more. It would be hard to cover his entire career and the impact he's had on the art of puppetry in 10 episodes, but we get a good start here as Tony Urbano is my guest on this episode of Under the Puppet. You're listening to Saturday Morning Media, and now... Back to our show. Welcome to the show that talks to puppeteers about the art and business of puppetry. My name is Grandpa Choco, and this is Under the Puppet. Well, Tony Urbano, thank you so much for being on Under the Puppet. My pleasure. I'm so excited to talk to you. I I will say that it was very hard coming up with questions because your career has been so amazing. Um, but hopefully we can cover most of it. And if not, you'll have to come back on the show again. Oh, good. Okay. Do you remember your first exposure to puppetry? Oh, yeah. I was four and a half uh, in San Francisco. And we had to take the ferry from the... Um, a train station across part of the bay to Treasure Island. And this was the 1939 uh, World's Fair. And they had a hand puppet booth doing a a very funny uh, advertising show for Roma Wines. And um, it was a takeoff on Romeo and Juliet. And, uh, And the... The uh, poor, beautiful young maiden wanted to marry the young guy, but her parents were making her marry the old man. And so they went to the cellar master, who just happened to be the Roma Wines logo, and uh, they came up with all these ideas. And finally, they reached this incredible finale where the old man sticks his head out of a carriage and they hit him on the head with a club. And I thought, at four and a half, I thought, that is funny. Okay, <laughs> after that, that's all I wanted to do. I really? I wanted to do puppets. Yeah. What was it about the show that captured your... Was it just the, the, the comedy in it? Is that what... Everything. Well, the comedy, the... Uh, uh, you know, I was four and a half. My father had to put me up on his shoulders mm-hmm. to to see the show. I sat on his shoulders, but I love the audience. I just love the fact that these dolls were making the audience laugh and feel good. That I think was what really, really drew me in, big time. Yeah. yeah. Well, and shortly after that, you had a few marionettes, right? You you got a few marionettes. Oh, we bought some. Um, uh, we'd go. My mother would take me downtown, San Francisco, and we'd buy these twenty-five cent cardboard marionettes. That you know were were. I mean, and there there were at that point, um, Jim Henson hadn't opened his mouth yet, so uh, almost all the puppets were marionettes, and uh, um, so there were all these different marionettes that you could get for. 25 30 cents and um and yeah that then i graduated to hazel which were more expensive they were like two dollars and fifty cents whoa and then i went on to clippos uh made by virginia austin curtis and um then i started making my own puppets i was about maybe eight uh, I was one of these really precocious little kids that could read at the age of five. So I practically lived in the in the public library, our branch. And uh, I made my first marionette head with a plaster mold. And I sculpted it in clay and made the plaster mold and and had all this extra plaster. So I just flushed it down the bathtub and that clogged up all the plumbing 
and San Francisco being what it was, the houses were plastered together, no pun intended, and it cost a fortune to redo the plumbing, and so you won't be surprised when I tell you my parents were not very interested in having me take up puppeteering. Um, and uh, I think the first time that my mother got it at least a little excited was when I was leaving to tour Russia with Bill and Cora Baird, and we were interviewed by, um, oh, God, Walter Cronkite. Wow. And they saw this on television. They thought, well, <laughs> maybe the kids got something. Who knows? <laughs> anyway, yeah. that's how I got started. Yeah. And you were doing shows for like local kids, right? You were creating your own shows. Oh, the then? libraries and schools and uh, my schools. And um, yeah, that's for the most part. Then my mother joined the Eastern Star. My father was a Mason, so she joined the Eastern Star, which is kind of the ladies' wing of it. And so she would always get me in to entertain the ladies because I was free. <laughs> and uh, I should have known then what kind of income you make doing marionette shows. <laughs> yeah, that, that sort of led to other things. Yeah. Were your parents creative? You know, they were wannabe flamenco entertainers. Oh, really? And they just didn't know how to pursue it and how much, how much patience and tenacity you had to have to make it pay off. So they never f really followed it. And my mother was really talented. She sang um, in a production uh, at the Santa Barbara Fiesta. They do a big show and uh, every year. And um, this particular production was based on um, Dana's uh, Two years before the mast, I think. I don't know. Anyway, it's a scene where the ship pulls into Santa Barbara and the hero uh, attends a, a wedding of a Spanish grandee. And um, the uh, narrator was Vincent Price. And so that was the name uh, in the show. And uh, my mother sang as part of the, uh, as a flamenco singer for the dancing and uh, I was impressed even if she wasn't impressed with the puppets I was impressed she got to do this so yeah anyway that's that's what they wanted to do but as far as puppets you know after the plaster incident they were totally against it they really wanted me to be um, somebody that could make a success of their living preferably radio repair i don't know why that but that's what they wanted me to do how did it come about that you started taking classes with master puppeteer ralph chesse uh it was my first day of high school and i had to take two different buses um i got off the first bus to make a transfer at the corner of market street and third and there was a window uh of the san francisco examiner uh, a window display with a, a Hamlet marionette by Ralph Chasse and a notice about a class that he was teaching in the evenings. So um, I signed up. I was 13 years old and I took the bus in the evening from Candlestick Park all the way down to Market Street and then transferred to another bus and went all the way to the other side of San Francisco. And I mean, nowadays, parents wouldn't allow that to happen. But in those days, what could go wrong, you know? Anyway, I, I took classes with him um, uh, on making puppets. And at the same time, um, he taught another class, which I also attended, um, where he taught manipulation. And he was... Um, what it really was, was he was getting ready to present a quite elaborate production of Oliver Twist. And um, so he used 
people from the class, and he cast me as Noah Claypole, who's the undertaker's assistant. And uh, I also understudied Oliver. I was 12 at the time. And um, yeah, that was how I first got into uh, got into performing for a pretty big house, um, Marines Memorial in San Francisco. Were you the youngest person in that class? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was another puppeteer who went on to uh, do quite a bit with puppets and uh, hand puppets primarily. And her name was Letty Connell. And uh, Letty became very big in the Puppet Guild and and Puppeteers of America and things like that. So, And we became very good friends. What do you think is the most important technique or tip that you learned from Ralph that stuck with you throughout your whole career? I think I was too young to pinpoint anything special. Um, uh, in fact, all I can remember was uh, I had to push the Oliver marionette through a window uh, when he was helping to rob Mr. Brownlow's house, and the stage manager would shoot off a gun right next to my ear, and I never got over that. I mean, even when I got in the Army and I was firing M1 rifles and submachine guns, I still never got over Oliver's pistol shot. You've mentioned the army a couple times. What what did you what made you decide to enlist in the army? Um they had a special deal um where if you enlisted in the National Guard for 6 years and and that involved 6 months of active duty with the army uh, that it would count in uh, as opposed to just being drafted. And that all sounded great to me because I wanted to pursue puppetry. And um, it was amazing. I got into the, uh, by this time, uh, my mentor here in Los Angeles, Bob Kelly, uh, recommended me for uh, a job playing the uh, building and playing the NBC color peacock. Oh, wow. And so I was on a show with um, uh, Pat Boone, who had been my workout partner at uh, at uh, a gym. When he first came out, they paired me with him. And, <laughs> and he was one of the stars of the show. Um, they had a young girl uh, from New York who had just filled in uh, um, under studying for a dancer and became a success. And she was celebrating her maybe 19th birthday. And her name was Cheryl McLean. Oh, wow. And we were both celebrating our birthdays, both Tauruses and, um, and George Goebel and uh, a couple of other name people. And I was the, the, um, uh, uh, and they, they had no qualms about having this 18, 19 year old kid do the voice for the peacock. They didn't audition me. They just said, oh, yeah, you you made the puppet. You do the voice and <laughs> manipulate him. So I was the NBC peacock. And that's how I did it. And here I am, this kid on national television, and I'm just thrown into it. You know, no. Well, we got to try you out. Or, nah, nah, just, yeah, go ahead and do it. So, um, and a lot of my work was just that. They just, I don't know, maybe I had a cute face or something. <laughs> they, they are trustworthy eyes. Um, but that's how I got, you know. And uh, and then if I may skip to Bob Baker, sure. uh, he hired me. Uh, because he knew me from San Francisco, he hired me to help make puppets. But then, <laughs> it's amazing now that I talk about it, they had uh, uh, been a, a they had been hired to do uh, to build puppets for 
Del Monte ketchup for the Jimmy Durante show. And in those days, you didn't do the the commercial separately. They just cut from the main stage with Jimmy Durante and his guest star, Margaret Truman, uh, <laughs> to a little side stage. And I was there playing a tomato and a pineapple. <laughs> and again, I'm like this kid. And they're just saying, action. And so I'm a tomato and a pineapple. And, uh, and I just took it as a matter of fact that you just did these things. You just did big time TV without any preparation or any, anything. You just went up there and did it. And, uh, I guess I got spoiled because that was the beginning of my career and it just, you know, started at the top. I mean, yeah. and I took it for granted. That's how it happened. You know, ask another it, question. <laughs> well, I think, I think maybe if you, or if anybody was in that position and started thinking about it, like how, how am I here? Why am I here? That could throw your performance, but you were just like, yeah, this is what you do. I'm going to go up and be a tomato and a exactly. pineapple. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, I I um I wanted to ask about uh, uh the Turnabout Theater Company. Well, you know why they called the <clears throat> the uh, company was called Turnabout, right? It, in their permanent theater on La Cienega, there was a marionette stage set up at one end of the theater, and a full size live stage. Uh, uh, at the other end, uh, and they had streetcar seats in the middle, um, which uh, uh, the first part of the show was uh, the marionette show, and then during intermission, the audience would go to this beautiful little patio with olive trees in it and everything it was really nice, and they would drink spice cider, and meanwhile, um, the uh, streetcar seats were reversed, and when they came back, they would watch a very funny live musical um, starring Elsa Lanchester, who was famous at that point for playing opposite Boris Karloff as the bride of Frankenstein. <laughs> and um, her husband was Charles Lawton, who was a huge... Um, movie star. He was a character actor, but major star. Um, of course, they had to adapt their show for the tour. They uh, traveled with this huge steel stage. Um, and for the marionette show, uh, we had a marionette floor about three feet off the stage floor and these overhead bridges for the marionette manipulators to work on. The front bridge also had all the lights for the marionette show and weighed about five trillion pounds. So anyway, um, give or take. And uh, anyway, at the intermission, uh, we would all uh, strike the marionette floor and the overhead bridges, and that would set up the stage for the live review. And... Um, uh, I have to tell you that the front bridge was so heavy, we called it the monster. Anyway, after about three months on the road, all the puppeteers had these very lean, muscular bodies. I've never had one since, though. So. They just put out a book uh, about the turnabout, which brings back a lot of memories. And there's a a picture of us going on tour, and here's this teeny tiny Latino looking kid. Uh, I think I just turned 18. And um, uh, I had gotten that job through um, a, a marvelous Southern lady named Malcolm Christine Wilkes. And she made the costumes for Bob Baker. And she took a liking to me. And she recommended me to the turnabout. So I helped them make puppets for their first um, USA tour as the turnabout. And, uh, and then I, re I replaced my mentor, Bob Kelly, who was one of their main puppeteers. And he had become one of the hottest uh, 
art directors in television and won all kinds of Emmys and things. And so I took over his parts. And uh, so by the time they were ready to tour, I had done it all for them. And they just put me in as one of their main puppeteers. And there I got just put in, you know? Right. Yeah. 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 But what kind of shows were you doing with the turnabout? They were very sophisticated uh, marionette shows, very Noel Coward, very Cole Porter, very chic, very adult. And uh, the word of the day was double entendre. All the dirty stuff was very sophisticated. Okay. And they didn't say bad words. They just said double entendre words. And they were very funny shows. And they were all written by Foreman Brown, who was one of the original Yale puppeteers. And I learned an enormous amount from him about writing for puppets and making it entertaining. And uh, I hadn't really gotten that from anybody else and and uh, made a huge change, difference for me in my presentation later on. Yeah. Well, what are some things, if, if people are creating a live puppet show, what do you think are important elements that people should keep in mind when they're doing so? There's only one, the audience. The, the audience. most important thing I learned from them was if you're going to design and build a puppet, build it for its performance, which mm -hmm. means you have to start with the show, with the act, with whatever this puppet is going to project to the audience. You start with that. Then you start thinking about overcasting felt and hands and, and casting plastic wood heads and and making moving mouths and so on and so forth. First, it's what the audience is going to perceive, what they're going to get out of it. Uh, you know, for a while, I uh, made Sherry Lewis's puppets, and um, Sherry was without question the hardest working most professional puppeteer I've ever worked with. I mean, nothing was was just let go. If she thought something needed detailing, she did it. And uh, it was a major class for me in how to make your puppets better, how to make your performance better. Uh, anyway, she told me something once that I will never forget. And that is, one laugh is worth a thousand sequins. And I've never forgotten that. I wanted to ask you about Fairyland, because we've talked about Children's Fairyland um, in Oakland several times on this show before. Yeah. Um, and you were the director of Fairyland. Well, when, I, uh, uh, when the Puppeteers of America did their very first puppet festival in Southern California, I... Th for some reason, wanted to do a production and show it off. Now, I mean, this is a naive kid who was working at that point in the mail room at Hughes Aircraft. And we got a little magazine in from, from Ford Motor uh, called the Ford Times. And it was a really pretty little magazine. And it had a um a beautifully illustrated um article called the buggy whip era and i was so inspired by this that i wrote this operetta called mary louise or the horseless carriage and it was based on this article and these illustrations and um so we did it. I got some local puppeteers to help me. Malcolm Christine Wilkes did the costumes for free because she liked me. And, um, and I had some uh, Jack and Elva Aiken, who were local puppeteers, help with the stage. And, you know, and we did all this. And I did it on a shoestring. And I got all my friends from Turnabout, uh, Dorothy Newman, who was a a uh, full-time movie um, actress who was also one of the partners at Turnabout. 
and Francis Osborne, all these people came in and taped the, the, uh, the track. And, uh, and we went and did it for the Puppeteers of America Festival at UCLA. And uh, at that point, UCLA had a, a puppet class taught by a guy named Mel Helstein. And after dealing with him for about 10 minutes, I realized he knew nothing about puppetry. He had just sort of conned himself into this, into this job, you know. And um, uh, so anyway, we did the show and we had rehearsed one bow. That's all we knew was we all put the puppets down and we went around the curtain and we all bowed and came back behind the curtains. But the audience just kept applauding, applauding and bravoing and all of this. And the backstage crew was going, take another bow, take another bow. And we didn't know what a second bow was. Anyway, <laughs> we kind of stumbled out and, uh, and took another bow. And it turned out that this show was the hit of the festival, which blew my mind because I was a, an amateur, you know? And, and at that festival was Dorothy Hayward, who was the director of the Puppet Theater at Children's Fairyland. And she asked me if I would go to work for her. And um, I'd never been to Children's Fairyland, but it sure sounded better than the mailroom at Hughes Aircraft. So after the Army, I immediately went to work for her. I helped her build all the puppets, and then she got married and so I took over as the director, and um, we were doing four fairy tales a year. All of my writing was influenced by Foreman Brown from uh, Turnabout. Uh, everything was family-oriented as opposed to kid-oriented, because I figured if the kids are going to be there, their parents are going to have to be entertained also. Mm -hmm. So I did that. And one day, uh, we're just finishing a performance of, I think, Rumpelstiltskin. And uh, we're hanging up the puppets. And this attractive young couple stick their heads through the curtains and said, Hi, are you Tony Urbano? And I said, Yes. And they said, uh, uh, We've heard about you. We're puppeteers. Um, uh, my, my And the man said, my name's Jim, and this is my wife, uh, Jane, and we do hand puppets. And that's when a friendship started that led to very big things for me. And it was Jim and Jane, Hen and Jim and Jane Henson. Yeah. And uh, they were the best friends I had in New York. So uh, anything else? About well, I would like to, because um, I'm going to, I have a couple questions about Jim too, but I want to stick on uh, Children's Fairyland for a second. Sure. Um, you were, you were doing these, these fairy tales, but uh, towards the end of your time there at Fairyland, you were living in LA, but you were driving up and delivering these shows that you were creating. Right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and that lasted while I was working at Fairyland again, Bob Kelly, my mentor, uh, had been approached by Sid and Marty Croft to build these marionettes for a show that was going to be called Les Papay de Paris. And he couldn't do it because he was just totally... So he had recommended me. He called me and told me about it. So I went down, uh, when we had some time off, I went down, uh, met with uh, Sid, and uh, and they decided to have me build all the marionettes for Les Papay de Paris. And so I moved down there. And at the same time, I decided to study design uh, at Chouinard Art Institute, which was one of the best things I ever did in uh, learning about puppetry. Um, and uh, so I went up to do the last 
show I produced for them and uh, uh, block it and train the puppeteers and coach them. And uh, then I got back in the car and started driving back down to L.A. at like uh, 11 or 12 at night. And I had gotten about as far as Santa Barbara. And all of a sudden, I found myself going off the freeway. I had dozed off for just a minute and was going down the side of the hill towards the beach and uh, slammed on the brakes and decided it was time to give Fairyland my notice. Mm -hmm. And that's when I moved full time to L.A. So it was a pretty exciting way to make a decision. <laughs> yeah. As you're heading towards the down a cliff. Yeah. Well, you've also produced uh, I know I'm kind of skipping around timeline here, oh, but I'm, no I'm, bother. Trying, I'm trying to keep themes together here. But um in addition to Fairyland, you've you produced shows for other theme parks as well, including Disneyland and, and Universal Studios Hollywood. Um <laughs> what types of shows were you producing for for Disneyland and Universal? Um, that's after I had done, yeah, after I had done the first couple of productions for Poupé and a couple of shows for the Crofts in New York. Mm -hmm. And that's when somehow I got involved with Disney and, um, I started by doing TV stuff and then ended up doing these live shows, both the touring shows, uh, which would uh, use puppets to present one of their new movies. So they would advertise it by sending, having the show produced, and then flying it around from shopping mall to shopping mall in their old, own private plane, which was named, wait for it, The Flying Mouse. <laughs> so all the shows had to be designed to fold up into The Flying Mouse, which also had to carry the cast of four or five actor puppeteers. And uh, my favorite show that I did for them was uh, Pete's Dragon, but I also did another one, um, uh, of uh, Lady and the Tramp, which was really quite wonderful. And um, so I did those and then live t uh, television shows and then producing the big shows at, at Disneyland for them. That's They said, oh, hey, he can do that. Sure, he can put on these billion-dollar spectacles. So I did that. and uh, And I really... I mean, I was a Disney freak when I was a kid, so I mean, so much of my of my work was just a frustrated opera fan and Gilbert and Sullivan f performer, and and that really colored my work a lot in the in the shows. Yeah, excellent. Well, you know who I would, if you don't if you don't mind talking about, because uh, I know you mentioned him a little bit uh, earlier. But I would like to talk about Bill Baird and Bill and Cora and, and oh. you working with them. Well, I worked for them. Uh, <laughs> I was doing a show for Sid and Marty Croft in New York, and I heard that Bill Baird was auditioning for puppeteers to do a show on Broadway. Um, and so I went to audition for him. And, uh, and I think Bill was... When I told him what I was doing, I think he was more interested in just hearing whatever scuttlebutt I could tell him about doing the show for Sid and Marty Croft. And so we're we're sitting across a table from each other, no puppets in sight. And um and he said, Now uh the show uh is not gonna be happening for a while. I said, Well, that's okay because actually I'm flying back to San Francisco uh, to do a Gilbert and Sullivan uh, operetta for a while. And he said, what? And I said, um, I'm going to do a Gilbert and Sullivan. Which one? Well, uh, it's Patience. What are, what are you doing? I'm 
I'm playing Archibald Grosvenor. What? Oh, sing for me. And, <laughs> and, and so I sang Pretty Pretty Maiden from, Guilt, from Patience. And he went, oh, my God, oh, my God, listen, forget about the Broadway show. That's a couple of weeks. But we're going to Russia, and that's going to be a 10-week tour, and you can come with us, and and you can sing for us, and we're going to make puppets, and, and you can sit here and sing. And I thought, what kind of business is it that I've gotten into? So he took me all around, introduced me to everybody, and um, he said, you call us. Uh, as soon as you finish Patience, and we'll tell you what our s schedule is to rehearse for Russia. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and, and so I went back to San Francisco and did, and did Patience. Then I called Bill, and he said to, to come and um, get a hotel and... Uh, and they would pay for everything, and they would pay for my ticket. And so I had to finish up a couple of jobs or a couple of stints with the National Guard. <laughs> Is this weird? Um, and then I flew back, and I told a friend of mine, a New York friend of mine, that I was going to be coming back. And, and um, uh, his name was Bobby Short, and Bobby Short was a, a famous... Uh, lounge pianist and blues singer and he said no 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 don't get hotel and so he set me up with a room at an apartment owned by a guy named Jimmy Daniels his older brother was Billy Daniels who was a big recording star he had a huge hit uh, with uh, that old black magic and when I was growing up I mean I remember that song so I would come home from rehearsal and climb up the stairs and I'd unlock the door and there'd be this woman singing in, in the front room. And I thought, boy, has she got a voice. It was Ella Fitzgerald. I mean, we had these stars that you wouldn't believe that would just come over for drinks. And it was amazing. And anyway, we rehearsed and uh, and then we got interviewed by this newscaster and took off for for for, for uh, Russia, and we performed in six different cities with this elaborate production called uh, Davy Jones Locker, and uh, uh, which was written by Richard Rogers of Rogers and Hammerstein. His daughter wrote these productions. And uh, as a matter of fact, when I was leaving, uh, after I had done the, the World's Fair, I went to say goodbye to Bill and Cara, and they said, oh, how long are you in town? And I said, um, about three more nights. But I got a ticket for... Hello, Dolly, which is I've wanted to see for so long, but couldn't because we were doing the fair. We were seven days a week for 27 days. And and he said, oh, well, wait, I want to get I, I can get you a free ticket to a show that a friend of ours wrote. And it's it's doing really well out of town. And I said, oh, okay. And, and he said, it's based on the stories of Sholem Ligum. And I didn't know what that meant. And anyway, he got me a ticket. And so I ended up at the second night of Fiddler on the Roof. And the cast was sailing. I mean, it was like, and then, of course, it became one of the hottest tickets and, on Broadway. So, I mean, yeah. Um, but I have to tell you, Cora was all business, all business. In fact, she was, I think, the main reason Bill Baird got to have the name he had, because she handled all of that. And uh, Bill was 
uh, borderline insane. He was the greatest guy in the world. But like we would do a number in the show who was a pianist, honky-tonk pianist, and Bill did the voice and the head uh, underneath the the piano, and I did the, the hands from behind. And every time we would do the number, Bill would find a place to pinch me on the leg. And I mean, I had bruises up and down my legs from him pitching. I don't know what he thought, uh, why he thought that was funny. But anyway, at one point, um, we uh, it got to a point where they were going to do uh, a live appearance on a big time Moscow TV show. And... I was the only one who did not know that number. So I got to babysit their two kids. Well, babysitting was nothing I was really very good at. But I thought, well, if I can be the the peacock on NBC, <laughs> I can babysit. Right. So what I thought was terrific was to tell them the story of Psycho <laughs> with all of the knife and the blood and the th <laughs> the next morning we went down to breakfast and C Cora lashed into me and said, if you ever do that to my kids again, they couldn't sleep all night. And uh, so at one point, Tim and I were going to audition for, for Team America World Police and the person in charge was Peter Baird, who was now grown up. And I walked through the door and he said, oh, the guy that scared the hell out of me and my sister, and then came up and gave me a big hug. And I, I, it, it just, it was mind boggling. Yeah. Just to show you puppets aren't all what the audience sees. There's <laughs> right. more to it than that. Right. But you asked about Bill Baird. He was my idol when I was a kid. He and Walton and O'Rourke and Walt Disney. And uh, yeah, so I probably went off script here, but what, no. what else? <laughs> Perfect. Um, I wanted to ask you about Dusty's Treehouse. Oh, yeah. Because you, you, you worked on that, and it's an eight-time Emmy Award-winning show. Yeah. How did you land that job? How did that come about? Oh, that's interesting. Um, Stu Rosen, who put the show together, started on our local PBS station with a show called Dusty's Attic. And he had, I don't know who worked the puppets for him, but he then wanted somebody to do a um, puppet version of The Velveteen Rabbit, which is a lovely story for kids. And um, so he approached, I don't know, some friend of his mother's son did puppets. And and this kid was not me, because when when Stu offered him the show, he said, Oh, no, I'm not good enough for that. You should talk to somebody good like Tony Urbano. Now, see, I was too stupid. I'd say, oh, sure, what do you want me to do? Um, anyway, I did this production, which was quite lovely and done with illustrations. And, and it was just a beautiful little piece, not commercial. It was really, I hate to say, artistic, but that's what it was. But anyway, when Stu sold CBS with the idea of Dusty Treehouse, he called me and back and said, would you do the main characters and you can do the voices? <laughs> oh yeah, sure. So I built the three puppets. Um, uh, Scooter Squirrel, who was a, a little boy, maybe eight years old, and he was a squirrel, but always in mischief first of all i'm always honest almost most of the time sort of yeah. 
and um, I do all my duties around the treehouse unless I have to play baseball, and I always help keep everything clean unless I forget, and I've always been a good, loyal friend to all of you and all of my family here in the treehouse, and I always help someone like Stanley or Dusty when they have a problem, unless it's arithmetic. And Maxine Crow, uh, Maxine was our resident drama queen, and the adults loved her. <laughs> well, of course, it's perfectly clear to all of you that I, Maxine Crow, am the only one who can handle this tough job. And I really think it's dumb that I have to tell you why I'm so good. And then S Stanley Spider, who was this little boy, and I can't do the voice anymore, but he spoke in a high falsetto. And he was, he had eight little ten, no, six little tennis shoes and two little gloves. And he became the, the standout of the show, the whole show. I mean, he got more fan mail than anything else in the show. I'm just a little guy and I don't know too much, but I am always willing to learn, you know, what, to help everybody if I could. And I sure love everybody a lot. So for Dusty's Treehouse, uh, we would work on a 13-week cycle. And every week we would record or tape one show. And uh, given the budget, we would do about six hand puppet fairy tales that ran about six or seven minutes. We would do five short two to three minute puppet bits uh, usually the recordings, uh, and then we would do one really elaborate 25-minute um, uh, hand puppet productions that would sometimes take up the entire program. Uh, these would be like an original musical fairy tale. My favorite was Cinderella and um, Beauty and the Beast. And we had... Um, a young lady that played the piano for the show, and she would write all the music for this. And um, uh, or we would do a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta like the Mikado or HMS Pinafore. And sometimes we would do an opera, like we did the Barber of Seville, which was the kid's favorite because uh, when he's uh, giving the old man a shave, uh, uh, he, we would get a, a big brush with shaving foam on it and just lather it all over the puppet. The kids thought that was really <laughs> funny. Um, so uh, for the two or three minute bits, we would experiment with puppetry techniques like black on black or glove ballets, things like that. We started winning Emmys. I must say, I just sort of got used to it. I just took it for granted that we would always win the Emmy, <laughs> Best Children's Show. And we won the Peabody Award. And and uh, and even Tim Blaney, who came to work for me several years later, said when he was a kid, he watched it. So, I mean, that was, you know, pretty good. Yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic show. Um, and I've been watching clips leading up to this interview, and it's just so much fun. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. And uh, and we got to go everywhere. We got to go to the police academy. We got to go and see where soda crackers were made. And we got to see where different medicines were made. I mean, we really got a... I mean, it was really great. And these would be little docs meant for kids that would show them about these different things um, being made. And it was just a joy for us. Um, yeah. Puppets would be involved somehow. And, and with one exception, and that was where they were going to show kids all about the roller coaster at Magic Mountain. <laughs> well, great. Yeah. But to shoot this... <laughs> I'm not attached to anything, squatting underneath the seats with both Scooter and Maxine overhead. And we did it six times. And I was blue. 
I mean, bruised all over my body because I was just being banged from one side to the other. But hey, it's showbiz. That's, that's um, right. Yeah. That's right. Well, I wanted to ask because you, you've mentioned a couple of times about your singing and, and your love for opera. Did you take singing lessons? or I any, did. Or and um, now we're going to head back to the Crofts. But uh, I studied when I sang with the Lamplighters. I studied with their lead contralto, who was also a singer at San Francisco Opera. I mean, we're talking the big deal here. And um, so all my my training was as a legitimate baritone. And, um, <laughs> and then Sid <laughs> came to me and said, Tony, we're producing a show for NBC called Barbara Mandrell and the Mandrell Sisters. And we want you to be the lead puppet. I said, what is it? And he said, he's a a kind of big burly character called Truck Shackley. And I said, yeah, what does he do? Well, he plays the guitar and you will have another puppeteer with you inside the puppet who is a professional guitar player. And then you'll have a, 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 a monitor in there with you so you can see what the puppet's doing. And, um, oh, by the way, the puppet's sitting on a barrel. So you guys are actually in this barrel. <laughs> so we did two seasons of Barbara Mandrell. And I sang. My favorite thing was a a duet with Cousin Minnie Pearl of You Don't Bring Me Flowers Anymore. <laughs> we, uh, Tim Blaney at that point had become a, a part of my company and and he performed as Doofus, the uh, takeoff on, on um, Willie Nelson. And we got to sing, you're not going to believe this, we got to sing Cool Waters with Johnny Cash. And the most exciting thing, we got to sing Happy Trails with Roy Rogers. Wow. And I mean, every one of the puppeteers was just, <gasps> you know, and he came up to us just before we went to pre-record and said, you fellas mind if I come sing with you? And we went, no. And he <laughs> sang with us. And we're there going, oh, my God, this is, this is the most exciting thing in the world, you know. And uh, and we sang with all these other, you know. Um, gee, I wish I could tell you my Dolly Parton story. But you said this is family friendly. <laughs> well, I mean, if you can keep it family friendly. You can beep out the punch line, okay? Sure. So Dolly Parton is a star on the show and a guest star. And um, and we all used to rehearse in a big empty stage at uh, Sunset Gower Studios. And so we all come in to, for, to rehearse our song. And we were sitting at one end of the studio and Bolly, Dolly Parton was just finishing her rehearsal. So... Tim and I are sitting there. I'm on the sofa and Tim's sitting on the chair backwards and Dolly comes over and sits down on a chair and says, hi, fellas. And we all went, hi, Dolly. And pretty soon they had a skit they were doing where the three um, sisters were going to be played as children. So they had three little children playing the you know, the three sisters. And after they finished rehearsing, they, Dolly was still there. They come over with their moms and their autograph books, and they say, can we have your autograph, Miss Parton? And she said, well, sure, honey. And she grabs a, a book and signs it, and then a second. And then the third little girl says, why didn't they have a little girl to play you, Miss Parton? And Dolly smiles at them very sweetly and says, well, I guess they couldn't find one with big enough 
gates and the mothers grab the girls and drag them off and tim and i are falling on the floor and dolly gives us this really sweet smile and waves goodbye and exits and it would have to be one of the greatest experiences of our lives yeah, yeah. you'll have to be about that word but that's sure. okay sure that's that's great that's a fantastic story i'm glad you told it <laughs> Um, well, you mentioned Jim Henson, and I read in an interview that at one time you got a phone call from Jim Henson with a job offer that you that you sort of turned down. And can you well, tell us I that story? Well, I got to tell you, I saw a lot of Jim in New York. Uh, we'd have dinner occasionally, and and uh, and when we were doing the World's Fair, I would be so exhausted that and and my back was killing me because of marionettes were made out of dental plastic and they weighed a ton. And in fact, my neck never got over it and I developed a tremor. But I mentioned it to Jim. And so he would come over on the morning of my first day off, pick me up in his car and drive me out to his house in Connecticut. And Jane would massage me for three days. And then Jim would pick me up and take me home to my apartment. And when we were getting to the end of the of the gig at the fair, he said, um, look, Rufus Rose is doing a movie for pay TV. That's what they called it in those days. And he needs an extra marionette artist. Would you go do it just as a favor to me before you leave town? And I said, sure. So I went and worked with Rufus and Margot Rose, who were like, again, idols in my eye. I'd heard about them since I was first starting out. And we did Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp. And um, then I came back, and that's where I met Olga Stevens of Martin Stevens and Olga Stevens fame. And they were famous marionette artists who did brilliant marionette shows. And uh, so um, Margot was, uh, Olga was driving back to stay with Vivian Michael, who was the publisher of the Puppeteers Journal for the Puppeteers of America. And she was going to stay in Ohio. So I said, oh, drive back with me. I had my station wagon. Um, and so I drove her. We laughed all the way out to Ohio. And I stayed for a couple of days with another friend, uh, Larry Smith, who had a local TV puppet show and was well known in the puppeteer circle. I got home and decided I was going to start my own company. And uh, I went and rented a, a studio in Santa Monica. And uh, and we just were getting a job here, a job there. But I was building a one-man show to do women's clubs and things like that. And uh, and the phone rings. And I said, Tony Urbano Productions. I wanted to sound like my own secretary. <laughs> Tony Urbano Productions. Hi, T Tony. This is Jim. Hi, Jim. How are you? I'm fine. Um, I'm just calling because we have a TV show we've been offered and we want you to come back and work on it. And I said, would that mean living in New York? And he said, well, yes. And I said, Jim, I said six months in New York was all I could take. I mean, I just can't do it. But Honestly, I, I know the show, whatever it's called. He said, it's going to be called Sesame Street. And I said, well, I'm sure it's going to be a big hit for you. Now, you know who said that first, right? <laughs> and um, yeah, you. so he was very, he said, well, think about it. We want you to um, take over, be in charge of the building, and then come and coordinate the building with the puppeteering and then puppeteer in the show. And I said, gee, it sounds really great. I just can't do it. I can't do it. And he said, well, thank you. Well, now, 
if it had been other people I worked for, they would have hated me. But Jim started sending, he knew I just started my company. And so he started sending me commercial jobs. And he started recommending me to TV shows. And he made my production company take off. And then, of course, he did the Muppets and made puppets a household word more than anybody and made my life a lot easier. And once in a while, he'd come out to do a show in L.A. and he would borrow my studio and uh, we would see the jobs he was doing you know, as a guest on some variety show or something. And, uh, and so that was my relationship with Jim Henson. But yeah, that was the show Jim offered me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, would have been better than being the NBC Peacock. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an amazing story and, and such an amazing relationship you had with him. And, yeah. um, and you, you mentioned commercials. Um, and, and I want to ask you, because you've done, You've done hundreds of commercials, just hundreds of commercials. It came out to what, about 300 and a little over 350 yeah. spots. Yeah. We, we, and, and some of the things you've worked on is Snuggles, the Snuggles Fabric Softener Bear and the Parquet Margarine. Parquet uh, Butter. Yeah. <laughs> Parquet. Yeah. Um, but I got I to gotta ask you just a little bit about the McDonald's Land commercials, because as a kid, for me growing up in the 80s, those those were everything, you know. Yeah. I, I mean, I saw probably almost all the ones you did. How how did the work on, on that come about, and, and what are your thoughts on on those commercials? Because you did so many of them. Oh God, I'm trying to think how we started. Oh 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 oh, I had started doing commercials for a producer who became one of my best friends. Uh, Angelo Antonucci. And uh, guess what, Grant? He was Italian. And, <laughs> really? <laughs> and his son has moved out here now um, and produces shows for Disney. Um, he was a little boy when I was working with his dad. Uh, anyway, we made a, a gondola puppet who came on stage wheeling a big, I mean, rowing a big gondola and he would introduce himself as, uh, how are you? My name is Angelo Antonucci, the singer. And when Angelo and his wife and kid came to see the show, they just freaked out. They, they just were so impressed and so surprised, you know. Anyway, okay. So he produced some commercials and somehow that led to one of the producers of the McDonald's commercials, who was working for another agency, produce a couple of spots, and then they in turn took me over to, um, th somehow that led to, to me doing some separate spots for McDonald's, and then they fell in love with me, and they had a puppeteer who was Unfortunately, it was, it was like a curse for him. He was just really hard to get along with. And so they asked me to take over. And he had done a ton of, of commercials for them. And they asked me to take over. And then this guy who happened to be a, an acquaintance of mine came up to me at lunch and said, Tony, I think they're going to fire me. And I thought, don't get me involved in this. And I said, well, just why don't you ask them if there's a problem that you could take care of it and make it all better. But by that time, they had already made up their mind. So anyway, we started doing all the McDonald's after that. And, uh, and some of them were great fun. And, uh, and especially the Chicken McNuggets, which were our all-time favorite spots to do because we not only made the puppets and operated them 
and I staged everything, but um, the show, the, the commercials themselves were so cute, you know? We did one called uh, Scary Story. It was a Halloween. Well, anyway, we made a, a Count Dracula McNugget who said, he had a line that said, that, what, what are they doing? And it, they're in the sauce. The sauce is for dipping and got to be just a catchphrase and we still we still say it what are you making we're staring up secret sauces <laughs> for dipping and then an interesting thing happened they insisted on bringing in voiceovers um uh, to do the voices and but they would always use our voice for the scratch track. In other words, for when they shot, we'd do the voices, then they would just fill them in with these voiceover people. By this time, Tim Blaney, who has already become my partner um, in the company, uh, had done the voice of number five in Short Circuit and the voice of uh, the dog in Men in Black and Frank the Pug Pug and... uh, uh, the Puck Marin in Flight of the Navigator and other things. Well, they they made a spot, I think called Silly Story. And uh, so they did the scratch track with us. And then they brought in the voiceover people. And I kept saying to the producers, why don't you just leave our voices in them? No, oh, no, no, we got to use this. Well, they had the two commercials and they couldn't tell which voices were ours and which voices they had dubbed in. And they called us and said, would you recognize? I said, gosh, just use the best voices. They used our voices. (laughs) And after that, I said, did it ever occur to anybody how much money you'd be saving if you just used our voices and paid us as puppeteers? Oh, yeah. (laughs) So after that, we did the voices all the time. And uh, we had one funny incident. Our client, who at that point was representing McDonald's for us, was just an adorable lady who had worked for the Kyoto brothers before taking over at, at uh, uh, McDonald's, the company itself. And, uh, <laughs> and she was just a doll. We adore her. And um, Susan like, and little Susie McNugget. And she came in one day to a meeting and she said, Tim, why did they give you star billing in short circuit? I just saw it on the on the plane coming in. And Tim said, well, I played the robot number five. That was your voice? Yes. And then she started looking at the producers like, wait a minute. <laughs> and the one producer said, yeah, 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 we're using their voices in the next McNugget spot. So after that, we just did the voices and, you know, yeah. Yeah. It's a funny business, Grant. It is. Funny business. It is. Well, you mentioned the movies that you've worked on and uh, you've done tons of of feature films. Um, You know, we we, we talked about Team America and you mentioned Short Circuit, which I have a couple questions on. But I would love to talk about uh, Flight of the Navigator. And Oh, excuse me. You know that there's a documentary coming out shortly called After the Navigator. Oh, really? And it's about the little boy, well, he wasn't little, he was 12, and uh, named Joey Kramer. He was great to work with, a real pro. And every day he would come on the set, walk up to me, and tell me the filthiest joke I had ever heard. And I don't know. So anyway, we, we he he went through a really rough patch, as a lot of child actors do. But then he got himself pulled together and he's now a, he was from Canada, 
from uh, Vancouver. And he went away and kind of got lost for a while and went through a really bad patch, as I said, and they got himself pulled together and moved back to Vancouver and was approached by this uh, young lady who does documentaries and had done one about the actor who played Flash Gordon and uh, uh, had gone through, you know, what it takes to make a documentary. And anyway, uh, so we get back to little Joey Kramer, who now looks like the leading man in a, in a soap opera. He's this major hunk and obviously got his act cleaned up. And, you know, I hope now it's going to be offered work as an actor, uh, as, a, as an adult actor. And anyway, that, that's coming out after The Navigator. Yeah, that was great. Really fun to shoot, and we had a scene with a 16 year old girl who played the craft services girl in the laboratory science factory where one of the scenes is laid. And she grew up to be the star of Sex in the City. Um, Sarah Jessica Parker. Sarah Jessica Parker. Yeah. So it was funny to play with her as not play with her, uh, play uh, with in a scene with her yeah. uh, as a as a teenage girl, and then see her that later in the a very adult show like like Sex in the City. Right. Yeah. Uh, some directors don't really know what to do with puppets, and that insecurity can lead to tension and conflict on the set. Randall was not one of those directors. He embraced Max and the the creatures as characters, and that made a huge difference. Uh, one of the things, too, that I remember was Joey, the little boy, had to cry uh, in several scenes, and Randall was so good with Joey. He would quiet the entire set down and he would sit with Joey in a corner and he would just talk very quietly to, to Joey and Joey can, would start working up the tears and Randall would wave to the camera to start. And I always was impressed with that. But anyway, I'm, I'm happy to say now that he has become a personal friend and he's a great guy, very generous and open. When, when the actors are playing opposite a puppet, it's the actor's belief in the puppet as a character that really helps to make the puppet alive on screen. And uh, Joey was great with this. I mean, he was a kid, but he just did it. He was like a little natural actor. It was wonderful. David, what were those strange sounds? Strange sounds? From the geek's car. <laughs> Well, that's called music. I want to hear more music. Can you pick up radio waves? I'm equipped to receive over two million forms of radio waves. I can monitor all frequencies of okay, electrical. Okay, okay. See if you can pick up some signals that sound like what we heard. Well, and you, you mentioned uh, Short Circuit because you were in charge of uh, the robotic puppetry there for Short Circuit. Yeah. What were the challenges of bringing Johnny Five to making Johnny Five alive? Boy, that's a good question for a lot of reasons. First of all, they hired a special effects company to build the, the robots. They didn't even think about who was going to manipulate them. And at that point, mid-80s, it was almost an unwritten law that if somebody built the puppets, they would perform them in the movie which is really a bad idea because they didn't come and audition. They just said, oh, here, you know how to move this joystick, which I've always thought of as a prelude of a dirty joke. But anyway, um, John Badham had been signed on to the film, which was one of the reasons it got made, because he was really hot. He had done uh, war games and and just these really great films. 
And, uh, oh, yes, yeah, Saturday Night Fever. How did I forget that? He thought to call the Muppets and see if they could send over a puppeteer. He just happened to end up speaking to Faz Fazakash, who was a longtime Bill Baird puppeteer, who had switched over to the Muppets. And Faz said, wait a minute, you got Tony Urbano out there. Why don't you hire him? And John Badham said, I'm sorry, who? <laughs> anyway, he called me in for a, for a, a, a meeting, not even touching this, this robot, which I can't even call a puppet. Uh, John Badham spoke to me for a while, and he said, oh, you go to Ashland for the Shakespeare festivals? And I said, yeah. Oh, God, I love that. Oh, wow, really? Oh, well, what are your favorite Shakespeare? It was like Bill Baird all over again. <laughs> so anyway, we went and we tried to work the thing, and it was so stiff and so awkward. And then if you just did one thing, uh, you tried too hard on something, it would break. So they finally got, got smart and said, why don't you guys go in to where they're building these things and see if you can maybe suggest stuff. And so eventually we got to know uh, some of the main, um, they didn't call them puppet makers, they called them animatronic builders, audio animatronic, no, not audio, animatronic builders. And we found the ones with talent and we asked if we could have them on the set with us to puppeteer. And the producer uh, had asked if we, any way we could do that because they were going to have to pay them just to be on the set to repair the puppets, and uh, which happened a lot. So anyway, we worked it out. But at the end, they approached him and said, would you do the voice? Because that was such a big part of the character. So Tim went in, he did the voice, and then he had to do some live appearances with the robot. And who was it, Princess Diana? Oh, Fergie and Prince Andrew? I suppose. Fergie and Prince right. Andrew yeah, came out and Johnny Five said to Fergie, well, nice dress. Huh? Oh, nice hat. <laughs> and Fergie looked at the, at the robot and said, well, thank you. <laughs> so Tim has no shame. You know, he doesn't. <laughs> Dead. Disassemble. Dead. Disassemble. Dead. Hey, slow down. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think it's important that when productions are planning out whatever movie or film they're going to make and they're going to have something like a robot with a puppeteer or just regular puppets, do you think it's important to have a puppeteer in those meetings? You know, if you had said this to me years ago, I would have said, well, hell yeah. <laughs> but having been through so many of these things, all I do is think, why didn't they think that? It's only John Badham. And then after John Badham, um, Rick Baker, who is a genius, Rick Baker saw um, Short Circuit. And he was one that, that suggested to the producers of Men in Black that they come and get us and get us in where the the puppets hadn't been quite finished. Uh, it was, I mean, Rick's puppets were at least made by a company where they appreciated performance. He didn't make these just to look good on, uh, on a stand in a museum. You know, Rick was, thank God. And um, uh, there was, he blackmailed us, Rick Baker. We went in for a, an interview and and his daughter walked in, she was about nine, and she was selling Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> and Rick looked at us and said, 
you want the job? <laughs> Buy the cookies. <laughs> so we had a really nice relationship with him after that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that working with Rick was an enormous compliment. But he understood. And John Badham, the director of, men of Short Circuit, understood. And these other people, it doesn't occur to them until the whole, they've spent one or two million dollars building these things that, oh, wait a minute, somebody's going to have to make them act. Mm -hmm. And it, it got to where nobody wanted to use animatronics again. And then green screen showed up and and uh, um, CGI showed up and look, we don't have to use the puppets. These people can make it act right away, right there. And that started killing audio animatronics on screen. And once in a while when they bring puppets in, it's a Muppet style thing. And all I can tell you is I got out and retired just in time. Hmm which is probably not what you want to hear on under the puppets. But, yeah. No. Well, um, well, I, I think um, we've talked about this on the show before, but the, that, you know, there's a little bit of, of puppets and creatures coming back. You know, it seems that there's a resurgence, like in the star Wars films, instead of using uh, CGI Yoda, they brought the puppet back, you know, for this most recent one. So that's great. I, I think it's, I think it's coming back. And you know who the original Yoda was. Of course, Frank Oz. Yes. Yeah. Now, when I got out of the army, this really lovely family with the heaviest Dutch accents you've ever heard, well, Belgian and Dutch, had met me at a puppet festival. They didn't know me. They just knew my work. And so when Dorothy Hayward hired me to work in Oakland at Children's Fairyland, this couple who I didn't really know said you should move in with us you should come we've got a room well I don't have any money don't worry about that you just live with us and and that's okay and these three these two people who had come from from Holland who had been captured by the Nazis and thrown in concentration camps and who had the woman was very beautiful and were just led a life that you couldn't believe how horrible it was. And then they escaped to London and the husband joined the resistance and went back to Holland. And then they moved to Idaho and then to the San Francisco Bay Area. And then, then they had, he got a job as a, as a window decorator. And then he got three kids. The oldest was named Ron, and they were into puppets. Ron wasn't interested in puppets. He was interested in athletics. He was a straight A student. In any other family, he would have been the golden boy. In this family, he was not the black sheep, but maybe the charcoal gray sheep. He just he just didn't fit in. The second son, Frank, uh, Frank liked puppets. He did puppets. And the daughter, Jenny, the youngest, got into puppets. And uh, and then Frank, the sort of his mother, Frances Osnowitz, made my costumes. And 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 after a while, Frank got to be a t teenager, and he came and started working in the marionette shows. And then I was in Russia with the Bairds, and I got a letter in the mail through the embassy, and it was from Jim Hansen. And Jim said, hi, Tony, I know you're probably busy in Russia, but I'm thinking of hiring this kid who worked for you at Fairyland. And his name is Frank Osnowitz. And I just want to know if you think he'd be worthwhile hiring. 
And so, of course, Frank to me was this little kid. I mean, when they start as a little kid, you know, like Mallory Tarcher, I can't think of her as not being a little kid and not being the new Sherry Lewis. It's just tough. And so I wrote back and said, oh, yeah, yeah, Frank's very funny. Once a very wealthy lady came backstage to look at the puppets from Rumpelstiltskin, and we were just closing up, and, and the lady said to Frank, who was maybe 17, does this spinning wheel spin straw to gold? And Frank said, no, you have to eat it here. And I thought, Frank's funny. So I said, yeah, he's a very funny guy. So Frank cut the Zinowitz off his name and became Frank Oz. And how's that for a backstage story? Yeah, that's perfect. That's, <laughs> that's why I do this show, to hear those stories. Well, um, as we're wrapping up here, I did want to ask that uh, I want to say that one of the reasons I wanted to get you on this show is because your name gets mentioned so many times um, yeah. on the show. And, and that's because you've trained so many puppeteers. And, you know, I've, I've interviewed Tim Blaney, um, uh, Phil Puber, Bruce Lenoyle, just to name a few. What qualities do you look for in puppeteers who are going to work for you or that you're going to train? Okay, that's really easy, but it's really something anybody should hear if they want to be a puppeteer. Yes. Like I say, it used to be a really misguided thing that if the person made it, they got to work it because it was SAG wages. That's the only reason. Um, I started finding out that people that had called themselves puppeteers were not talented in performing. And so I started looking around and I found dancers had, not all dancers, just some, uh, theater arts majors. Uh, there were people there that just picked up the puppet and worked it. No training, no school, no nothing. I would just show them, now this bar works the two legs. If you tip this this way and that way, it'll nod and bow. And you just look in the mirror and you start working. So this, this young kid said, uh, I saw your ad at UCLA and it said you're looking for people to paint scenery for your puppets. And I said, yes. He said, I'm an art major at UCLA. And if I could, I'd like to show you my, my portfolio. And I said, okay. And uh, so he came and he auditioned, but I always tried no matter what they were gonna do, if they were gonna sculpt or if they were gonna sew, they had to work a puppet because I wanted people who understood performing, not just making a statue. And so this kid, and I hadn't paid attention to this kid at all. I showed him how to work Mary. And so I looked and he was really working the marionette just brilliantly. This was Tim Blaney. I always wanted somebody who could look forward to the performing element. And that's how Pete, how Tim got in to the company. And later I used him in a show and I went down to the theater to for a weekend just to make sure they were doing it all right. And I went into the theater and I heard Clark Gable. I thought, what? And then I heard another movie star. And I went back around the crowd. And here was this red-haired kid. Well, I didn't really know. I trained him, but I didn't know. And he was doing all these voices brilliantly. And it was Tim Blaney. And I said, do you want to audition for some commercials? Uh, well, yeah, if you think I could do it. So he auditioned and he got the part and I've never been able to get rid of him. <laughs> He's just been hanging in, how long, 40, 
<laughs> 42 years, 43 years. Anyway, it's been um, an incredible relationship. But to go back, everybody that's going to be a puppeteer should know at least how to sort of build, and they should know how to bring it to life. If they can't, they shouldn't be in the business. They just right. shouldn't. Okay. Right. All right. All right. Well, as we wrap up here, the, the final question I always like to ask is, what has been the highlight of your puppetry career so far? Okay, well, there's lots. But I would say I was asked to do a life-size horse for the San Francisco Opera production of The Elixir of Love. And then after going up and trading the guy with it, uh, the, that was a chorus member who was going to be trained to work it. Um, they gave us a pair of fabulous tickets for opening night. And I invited Frank's mom, Frances Osnowitz, to be my date. And we saw the show. And at the end, the... I'm going, to st I'm going to tear up now. The horse got great reaction and a lot of laughs. And the curtain came down on the opera. The audience started applauding. And there's this delay. And then the curtain goes up. And there's the horse all by himself. And his head posed with a big smile. And the audience shot to its feet and gave it a standing ovation. And then the cast came on. And that's got to be the biggest compliment I've ever gotten for anything I've ever done. But then I'm an opera freak. I mean, there was a point where I was doing the Dean Martin TV show for the Crofts, and uh, I'd be on the set and there'd be Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and Peggy Lee and all these stars. And I would think, gee, if I was into pop music, this would really be exciting. But being an opera freak. <laughs> well, Tony, I can't thank you enough for taking the time uh, to talk to us today. And um, thank you for sharing your stories. And I'm finally, I'm glad to finally have you on the show. Oh, it's been a pleasure, really. I cannot thank Tony Urbano enough for being on the show. For links to some of the things we discussed, check out the show notes for this episode, episode number 51, over at underthepuppet.com. You know, we have one more bonus Tony Urbano story for you, and it's available exclusively on the free Under the Puppet app for iOS and Android. Click on the gift icon in the entry for this episode on the app to access it. You know, Tony has so many amazing stories, we've already started making plans for him to come back on the show and tell even more of them. Stay tuned. I'd also like to thank past guest Tim Blaney for making this interview happen. Well, now it's time to announce the winner of episode 50's giveaway for a brand new copy of the essential puppetry book, Figures in the Fourth Dimension, by Ellen X. Rixford. The question was, when Matt Vogel was performing his own puppet shows after college, what did he use to build his puppet stage? And the answer was, 4x4 stretched Muslim painting canvases that were hinged together. We had more entries than ever before for this giveaway, but there can only be one winner, and that winner is Jason Miller. Congratulations! Congratulations, Jason. Your book is on the way. Now, we have an incredible giveaway for this episode. It is for a one-year individual membership to Unima USA. Unima USA is the North American center of Unima, the oldest international theater organization in the world whose mission is to promote international understanding and friendship through the art of puppetry. Not only does a membership to Unima USA include fantastic networking possibilities, it also includes a subscription to the twice-yearly Puppetry International magazine and access to the entire digital catalog of past issues. For more information, visit unima-usa.org. Not only will the winner of this giveaway get a year-long membership, they will also receive some pretty cool Unima USA swag as well. To be entered to win, all you have to do is find the answer to this question from the episode you just heard. 
What marionette production was Tony Urbano performing in where the stage manager shot a pistol off right next to his ear? When you find the answer, send it in an email to underthepuppet at gmail.com with the subject line giveaway and you'll be entered to win. All entries for this giveaway must be received by September 15th, 2020. The winner will be chosen at random from all correct entries and be announced on the October 1st, 2020 episode of the show. One entry per household. Good luck. Special thanks to Jeffrey Comier and the Unima USA Board of Directors for donating the giveaway for this episode. If you're not a member of Unima USA, check them out now at unima-usa.org. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Under the Puppet. If you have questions, suggestions, or feedback about the show, call our voicemail line at 818-806-9604 or click the Call the Show button in the free Under the Puppet app for iOS and Android. You can also send your questions, comments, suggestions via email to underthepuppet at gmail.com or you can connect with the show on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram by searching for Under the Puppet. Thank you so much for listening. Talk to you next time right here on Under the Puppet. This episode of Under the Puppet featured music by Dan Ring and was edited by Stephen Staver. Under the Puppet is a production of Saturday Morning Media and made possible by the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons who've gone to patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and set up a monthly pledge for as little as a dollar a month. Patrons get new episodes before they are released, behind the scenes information, and exclusive bonus episodes. If you'd like to support this show and the other fun content from Saturday Morning Media, become a patron. Head on over to patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and set up your monthly pledge today. You can also tell a friend about the show or leave the show a review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for listening. Under the Puppet is copyright 2020 Saturday Morning Media, Grant Pachogo Executive Producer, all rights reserved. www.saturdaymorningmedia.com Under the Puppet proudly presents the adventures of Timmy the Tooth Reunion. In this almost 90-minute video, you will hear great stories from the cast and crew who brought this amazing puppet show to life. Plus, you'll see never-before-seen artwork and exclusive behind-the-scenes video. Under the Puppet's Timmy the Tooth Reunion is available right now at timmy.underthepuppet.com. You've been listening to Saturday Morning Media. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.